All right, now we're going to talk about data consistency. It's a really important topic when we're talking about uh, high performance, scalable database stored services. There's two kinds of data consistency. There's strong consistency. This is when two records that form a relationship with each other uh, and they form that relationship at the same time. Like a customer has order and an order also knows who the customer is, right? That's a relationship between customers and orders. When we talk about strong consistency, we frequently talk about ACID transactions. ACID is really an acronym, and it stands for Atomicity, Consistency, Isolation, and Durability. And this term has been around for many decades now. You can certainly go online to learn more about it uh, and understand all the intricacies of this term. But the basic goal of ACID transactions is it makes it look like one thing is time as one thing at a time is happening, even if the actual work that's being done is complex. In other words, we might need to update this customer information and we might need to update this order information. So multiple things are happening, that's the complex operation. But doing that as an ACID transaction makes it look like it either all happened at once or none of it happened at all. If any of it fails, the whole thing fails. And the way that ACID transactions semantics is provided over this complex workload, it's usually accomplished using things like distributed transactions or possibly by taking a lock on the whole database or portions of the database uh, and then manipulating things under the lock and then releasing the lock when it's all done, right? So using various uh, synchronization techniques. However, both of these technologies, that is distributed transaction and locks, they hurt performance because they typically mean that only one thing at a time can happen and so operations are then serialized. And they're also not very fault tolerant. Imagine a machine takes a lock on some pieces of data and then the machine that has the lock dies. So now that machine doesn't come back to release the lock later. So now that data is locked potentially permanently. That is an unacceptable solution, right? So, um, so we need to come up with things that are more fault tolerant as well as having good perf. So weak consistency is typically the alternative to strong consistency. And then with weak consistency, you can have two or more records that form a relationship, but the relationship is formed eventually. In fact, sometimes we call this eventual consistency instead of weak consistency. And an acronym that is used for this, just to be cute, is this BASE uh, acronym which stands for basically available soft state eventual consistency. And again, this term has been around for a while too, and you can go and look it up. But the base term is really more of a tongue in cheek as being the opposite of acid semantics. When we do eventual consistency or weak consistency, it is typically done viewing commu uh, by way of communication retries and item potency across stores. So this I've already been talking about a lot in this course about the value of retrying operations and then implementing those operations to be item potent. There is a theorem that is known as the CAP theorem. Uh, CAP is also an acronym. The C stands for consistency, the A stands for availability, and the P stands for partition. Um, but it really it's a network partition. And the CAP theorem states that you can only ever have two of these things, you can never have all three, all three of these things. More specifically, it means this. When in the face of a network partition, that is you have two data stores, um, but they are unable to talk to each other, right? The, the network has been partitioned, so they are unable to talk to or communicate with each other. You can either maintain consistency of the data by not allowing changes to the data, right? So, but then you have a loss of availability. In other words, I want to change a piece of data, but if I can't replicate it to the other replica because I have a network partition now, if I care about keeping that data consistency, I can't change the data, right? So I've lost availability of the database. I can't change this thing in the database because doing so I would affect adversely affect the consistency of these replicas. An alternative way to go is to say, well, I want to maintain availability. I want to be able to change the data in the database.
But if I have a network partition, that means that I can change it in one replica, but not the other replica, and now I have a loss of consistency. And then you have to decide when you're choosing a database to integrate in with your solution, which of these things do you care more about? And you can't say, I don't want a network partition, because a network partition can always happen due to hardware failure. So that's always inevitable. So assuming that a network partition will happen, do you care more about consistency, uh, which means you will have a loss of availability if a network partition happens, or do you care more about availability, which means you have a loss of consistency if a network partition happens? To help drive these concepts home, I've created an animated slide where you can see this. So here I have um, three replicas of my data, and they all have AAA as the pieces of data. So now all the data is consistent across these three replicas. A network request comes in, and we're going to try to change the data from AAA to BBB. So the load balancer goes to the primary replica here, and the primary replica tells the two secondary replicas, we want to change the data from AAA to BBB. So let's say the replica at the bottom, it successfully changes from AAA to BBB, and it goes and tells the primary replica. Now the secondary replica at the top right, what if that crashes? So now we, in effect, have a network partition, right? We have now lost a, um, a communication with that other replica. But now we have two replicas here. One has AAA and one has BBB. So the data is now inconsistent. So what do we do? Right? So you have two options. Right? The one, first option is if you care about consistency, right, um, if enough stores, so if enough replicas don't acknowledge the change, then the database can decide not to respond. Right? So now this primary replica cannot respond back to the client. And because if it did respond to the client, it's effectively saying, I took your change and I have replicated it everywhere. But because we were unable to replicate it everywhere, we're not going to respond to the client, or maybe you respond with failure to the client to say, I'm not taking the BBB. I'm not, it's, we did not change the data to BBB. Right? So now uh, the database either won't respond or will respond with failure to avoid returning inconsistent data. Now, the hope is that in the future, another replica might come up and join the network, and then we can retry this operation and get the, the state to be fully replicated with BBB after we do the retry. An alternative is, if you care more about availability instead of consistency, then you could say, well, okay, this store that went down, it didn't act the change, and we can say, and it doesn't have to act the change. So now we have AAA somewhere, and we have BBB somewhere, and we can respond back to the caller and say, okay, look, I got your BBB, uh, and the, of course this replica could update to BBB if it wanted to, and could say, all right, I got it, but you know, it's possible that you know, we can get an AAA or a BBB back, right? So if, if we go and talk to another replica, maybe it did or didn't happen. So you've lost some kind of consistency between these various stores. So that's the CAP theorem, and all databases have to make a choice on the CAP theorem. Some of them actually have a dial where you can say, I prefer consistency or I prefer availability, and those are the trade-offs. Uh, and so I'm hoping that this conversation introduces you to the theory. All databases have to make a decision, or they leave the decision up to you, the user of the database, but then you have to make a decision, and you have to think through do you prefer consistency over availability or availability over consistency for the data that you're trying to store? All right, the last thing I'll say about this is for consistency or availability, which is better? Well, it's usually, again, a bit of a conflict. Businesses love when the service responds to customers. So in other words, businesses really like availability. They don't like a customer using your service and then for your service to say, you can't place the order now because we've lost some network connectivity with some of our other nodes in the service, right? Businesses love accepting customer requests um, and you know, making the business more money. Developers, on the other hand, we love trusting the data. We like consistency. We like knowing that I change the A to a B and forevermore in the future, I will see a B unless I change it to a C. 
then forevermore in the future I'll see a C. We really love that. We know we can trust the data, the data is good, and we can build algorithms around that trust of the data. But do you really get this? Do, even though developers love this true consistency, and how many scenarios do you really truly get it? So for example, even though you really want this, it's very hard to get. If you, let's say, put your orders in one database and your customers in another database, is it possible to take a distributed transaction across those databases? In almost all cases, the answer to that is no. Doing distributed transactions across databases, different database technologies especially, is near impossible to do. And in a microservices world where services own their own databases, even if it happens to be the same database engine behind both of those microservices, you can't take a distributed transaction across those different services. So there's many scenarios where you just don't get the ability to do it because the very different technologies don't work well together. Um, you can't atomically transfer an item from an inventory service to an order service. You know, if you have, as, as an example, right? So I have an inventory service, I have an order service. In the inventory, we have five of some item and the person orders it. So we kind of want to transfer the item from here to here and we would like to do it as an atomic transaction. It either gets subtracted from here and added to here as an acid transaction or it doesn't happen. We don't want to lose the item. It's very hard to do that, especially if you're using different services or different technologies to store that data. But there's other scenarios where you don't really get this too. So let's say a user's looking at a web page and they are looking to see how many of a particular item is in stock at a company. So the, the company says, well, we have five of this item in stock and the user wants to buy all five of them. Well, while they're looking at the inventory page that shows five in stock, and before they say go and buy, somebody else might buy three of them. So now there's only two in stock, right? So there's a race condition there because effectively what someone is looking at in a web page is old or stale data. The moment the service returns that information back to the customer and they're looking at it, it's already old and may potentially be out of date. So while developers like the truth, there's again many scenarios where you don't actually get the truth. Um, there is also this pattern that I will be walking you through a little bit later on in this course called CQRS. Uh, it stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Uh, and with this pattern, the writes are done to update a database asynchronously, but the reads are done synchronously. And usually there's a step in the, in the middle there, which means that you're changing the data, but the Threads that are reading the data are actually looking at old data until it gets uh, refreshed up to date. And this is a very useful pattern, CQRS pattern. It's useful in a bunch of scenarios, but if you adopt this pattern, the pattern requires an eventual consistency model. The last thing I'll say about this subject is about a thing called apology-based computing. The first time I heard about this, which was well, maybe 10 years ago now, it's been a while now, um, it was fascinating to me. I'd never heard of it before. Uh, and basically, this apology-based computing model is saying that a lot of times our software models the real world, right? We build software that models the real world. But the real world is actually the truth, not the software model. Again, an example of that is um, we have five of these items in inventory. And let's say the user goes and purchases one of those items. So you say to the user, success, you have purchased this item. We're now going to ship it to you. Um, well, let's say it was just one item that was in stock and the person bought the last item. So now at the company, they're trying to take that item, put it in a box so they can ship it to you. But as they're putting it in the box, they drop the item on the ground and the item breaks. So that was the last item they had in stock, and now it's broken, they're not gonna ship it to you. So that's what really happened in the physical world. So now what happens? Well, the company goes back to you and they apologize. And they say, look, you, we told you you bought this item, we charged your credit card for this item, we were about to ship you this item, but we accidentally broke the item. Uh, and lots of other things could happen the item on the way. So, um, so where the item gets physically destroyed during the shipping. 
So now the company gets on the phone, and they, or they send you an email probably, and they say to you, hey, we're sorry that this happened. We apologize to you. And then usually they compensate you in some way. Um, they can say, well, we'll ship you the item, but it's not going to ship on time now. We're, it'll take us a couple more weeks, and we'll get another item in. Or maybe the item's been obsoleted now, and they won't get another one in. So they can give you a refund. Even though they charge your credit card and told you it was coming, they'll now give you a refund, say it's not coming. Or they might give you a discount on some future thing. right? And this is what apology-based computing is. For me, what this has meant is that when I build software and I try to build it so that it models the truth, I know that in many cases it can't actually be the truth. And so where I would, in the past, make painstaking efforts to do transactions and locks and make sure that everything was absolutely up to date, I now relax those constraints when I write software a bit. And I think, well, so if the user gets a little bit of scale data, it's OK. If we have to go and apologize because we said something was true, but it turns out that it's not true, I mean, it depends on the frequency of that. If it's going to be untrue a lot, then it probably doesn't make me feel good. But if every once in a while we have to go back to the customer and apologize, I don't feel so bad anymore about doing that. And it also causes me to maybe write code that has the apology mechanisms built in. So we'll now give away for somebody to say, okay, this order, which we told the customer we were going to ship, somebody at the warehouse can now say, it's not going to, we'll apologize, and we have company policies about how we deal with this. Now, so it really has changed my perspective on how I think about architecting and building the software, and also about business models, too, for how to deal with certain uh, of these things that can come up because the physical world is actually the truth, and the software is really just a model of that physical world. All right, so hopefully this has been educational for you to understand about the pros and cons of different consistency levels. A lot of the world is going to this more of an eventual consistency model, and I have more to say about how to implement that and work with that as I go through uh, this course. Stay tuned.